now that we're on the topic of Andrew Friedman, I, you guys know, I am, I give credit where credit's due. Sometimes I give criticism where I think it's warranted, but let's talk about the best and worst moves that Andrew Friedman made this season and this Dodgers organization. So First and foremost, I want to preface this by saying that Andrew Friedman is without question one of the very best to do his job in this industry. He's right in the conversation with the best to do it, right? There's no doubt about that. But guess what? No one's batting a thousand, right? No one bats a thousand. This is Major League Baseball, right? You hit three out of 10 times and you're in the Hall of Fame. He's not batting a thousand. More often than not, he makes the right moves, makes the most sensible moves. Some of the moves that he's made or has not made have been out of his control. So this is not Andrew Freeman state TV or anything like that. But I will say that this year, it's going to be interesting how we evaluate this season, the moves he'd made or did not make years down the line. But the first one I would say, and you guys are probably be surprised by this answer. I would say his number one best move that he made, believe it or not, is re-signing Clayton Kershaw. And the reason for that is signs a one year, $20 million deal had a 246 ERA, a 3.7 war. So yes, he was awful. Had the worst start of his career. Absolutely forget about that start, right? I could have probably got up there and got a double off curse in that one. He was bad in game one, shortest outing of his career, right? Terrible, awful first pitcher in major league history to give up five hits of the first five batters he faced in the postseason. gave those six runs. He was bad. He also was injured. And before that injury, he pitched really well. And even when he came back, you look at his overall ERA, he had a 246 ERA and a 3.7 war in 131 and two thirds innings of work. So if you look at the value there, teams are paying eight, $9 million per war. And he's giving you almost four war for $20 million. So that's great value for comparison's sake. Max Scherzer had a 3.2 war and he made $43.3 million, right? So we'll see. Max Scherzer could come back this series and perform well, perform in the world series and make a ton of sense for that Rangers team. But I still think from a value standpoint, winning in the regular season, it still should be considered a W that's a W his second best move this year. Second best off season move in season move was the signing of JD Martinez. And I don't know how much credit I give to Mookie Betts and how much credit I give to Robert Van Skoyak, but still it's, he's the guy who deserves the credit because he's built this organization as far as the roster build over the year. And they get him on a one year, $10 million contract, one year, $10 million contract, a 1.9 war, which is not as much as you probably would expect. But the fact that he's a designated hitter, he doesn't get that war from defense. So it's always going to be lower than you would expect, but still 33 home runs and 103 RBI. So that is really good. That is really good for JD Martinez, right? I mean, you're talking about someone who had he played an entire season, he could have gotten 40 plus home runs. I mean, easily, easily. I mean, he ended up playing in 113 games, had less than 500 plate appearances, but at 893 OPS, that was up from 790. Last year with the Red Sox, he had 16 home runs in 139 games, 596 plate appearances. With the Dodgers, he had 33 just dingers in 113 games, 479 plate appearances. So JD Martinez, that was a W. I think that he's done enough to get himself a really decent multi-year contract with another team. But if they don't sign Shohei Otani, be interesting to see if they consider bringing back JD Martinez. But I just don't think it's going to happen. He's a Scott Boris guy. I think he wants another two, three year deal. And I think he's going to get it. So I don't anticipate him being back with the Dodgers. And then the third best move they made this year might surprise you a little bit. I'm going with Ryan Brazier. Ryan Brazier changed this bullpen. Some people might not remember this, but up until towards the end of June, this literally statistically was the worst bullpen in Dodgers history. They were an absolute dumpster fire. And Ryan Brazier, he was an absolute dumpster fire too, before he signed with the Dodgers on a minor league contract. I mean, from 2021 to 22, he had a 616 ERA and 83 and a third innings of work before he signed with the Dodgers this year, he had a 729 ERA and 21 innings of work with the Red Sox. And with LA, he had a 0.70 ERA and the Dodgers bullpen went from the worst in the league to the best in the league down the stretch, even in the postseason. 
Like I said, they were the favorite child in the postseason. They did everything right. They got straight A's. They stayed out of trouble in the postseason. They were outstanding, right? A lot of those came on Emmett Sheehan coming in the game prematurely early than he had expected because Kershaw did not perform well. Brazier ended up giving up that one home run. That definitely hurt some momentum, the bomb he gave to Gurriel, but this bullpen was outstanding. They were lights out and it's really unfortunate because this was a championship level bullpen. In my opinion. Now the big adjustment for Brian Brazier is Brazier was throwing that cutter to lefties and Ryan Brazier was effective with it. He was great all year was missing barrels. He was outstanding. One of those great reclamation project moves that they hit on. So he was great. And then for Jason Hayward, Jay Hay, I remember going to Dodger stadium during the winter and no one was working out and it was just Jason Hayward wearing his Dodger blue. I even asked him, I said, Hey, Jay, Hey, Dodger blue is better than Cubs blue. And he said, yeah, he liked it. He was feeling it right. He was putting in the work. And at the time he was seen as a long shot to make this team. I had people telling me Jay Hay was Hay washed, right? And he was coming off that Cubs contract that was seen by a lot of Cubs fans as the worst contract in their franchise's history, eight years, $184 million. And he completely turned his career around with the Dodgers. Like, I don't think people realize, I don't want to say how bad Jason Hayward was with, with the Cubs, but just how average too bad that he posted above average offensive numbers with the Cubs just for one season in 2019. That was a full regular season, right? Other was the short in 2020 season, but even then he was hitting 255 in 770 plate appearances last year with the Dodgers. He had 15 home runs and 377 plate appearances had a 121 weighted runs created plus. So his offensive production was 21% above league average. He played great defense. He allowed Mookie to play second. He put the Dodgers best lineup out there against right-handed pitching with Hayward and right Outman in center and Peralta and left. And he had the pop. I mean, you saw a much shortened stroke. And when I, we made, I'm not going to sit here, by the way, you guys know I will take a victory lap, right? I will take a victory lap, but I will not take one on Jason Hayward because I was not high on him. I asked you guys, if it was something, nothing or everything. I originally called this signing nothing because I just didn't think there was a world where he would turn things around. If you looked at his swing, it was so long. He struggled so mightily against fastballs. His swing was longer than a CVS receipt, but with the Dodgers, they shortened that stroke. It was more compact. He stayed within his mechanics for the entire season and he was hitting the ball hard. If you look at his stat cast percentile rankings, all above average, as far as hard hit percentage and barrel percentage, he was really fantastic. And like I said, 15 home runs in 377 plate appearances with the Dodgers in 2023, his last three seasons combined in Chicago, last three seasons, 685 plate appearances. He had 15 home runs. So he matched his home run total last year with the last three seasons combined with the Cubs. So Jay, Hey, he was great. And also too, let's point out the fact that the Cubs, they were on the hook for the bulk of that contract. So the Dodgers, they only paid him the league minimum. So that was subtracted from the 22 million that the Cubs were paying for. So it was a great deal. I think too, aside from his on-field production, I look at the fact that he was great in the clubhouse and he galvanized this group. I've spoken with him numerous times about being on this team and the chemistry. And he's just a big time leader. In fact, when the Dodgers lost after they got swept, Dave Roberts, he gives his speech every year and then he opens up the floor. Jason Hayward was one of the players who spoke to the team after they lost to the dime back. So Will they bring him back? I think I'd love to see him back in Dodger blue. He's made his money. I think he's a good fit. I think he's got a couple solid years in him. If you can get him on a team friendly deal, I would not be opposed to it. But yeah, just to give you an idea, Jason Hayward, he gave the Cardinals almost as much war in 2015, 5.6 F war, 6.8 B war that he did with the Cubs over a seven year period from 2016 to 22. So he, in one year in 2015, he had a 6.8 B war, right? In seven years with the Cubs, he had an 8.9 B war. So I don't think that people realize how under how much he underperformed in Chicago. Now the fifth best signing this year, the fifth best move that Friedman made, I got to go with Miguel Rojas. Now offensively, he was bad. Hit 236, had a 69 weighted runs created plus. Hit five home runs, was 30 31 percent below league average. 
but he was a top five shortstop defensively finished with 12 defensive runs saved. That puts him in the top five. Every defensive metric you look at, he was near the top. And I think the first year with the restricted shift and Max Muncy's bad defense at third base, you needed a trusted glove for a shortstop because there just weren't many options. And I think that Gavin Lux goes down and that definitely hurt this team. Gavin Lux was someone that they were hoping was going to hit around 300, take a leap, possibly make an all-star team. So to have Miguel Rojas, who they had already signed, who they had already traded for in the Jacob Amaya deal, come in there, be that everyday shortstop, be able to post, be able to stay healthy and on the field, play great defense all season long. His offense was picked up near the end. And how about this? Say what you want about his offense, but you know what was not on my Dodgers postseason bingo card? I never thought that Miguel Rojas would have more hits than Mookie Betts and Freddie Freeman combined. He ended up going two for four. He had two hits. He had two hits in the series. Mookie Betts and Freddie Freeman went one for 21. So that was the fifth one. I'll throw in a sixth one, by the way, and that's Kike Hernandez. Kike Hernandez, they traded for him. They ended up giving up Nick Robertson prospect, a right-hander, and a minor league right-hander, Justin Hagenman, on July 25th. And they get Kike Hernandez. He had had a bad year defensively and offensively with the Red Sox, had a 599 OPS. He sees that number spike up to 731 with the Dodgers. And he wasn't fantastic in the regular season. He still was below average as far as OPS plus, but still in the postseason, he showed up. He goes three for eight, had three singles. I think Kike Hernandez is someone I want to see back in Dodger blue. So I think those are the best, the worst. Let me see if you guys can guess the worst before we get into it. Because I think the worst, you might be surprised. My take on the worst one here. We got Kike should 100% be back from Danny Thomas. We got Love Miggy Rowe from V. Mookie didn't want to move to LA. He isn't comfy here. Freddie is still a brave deep inside from Champ. Love Miggy Rowe. I love Kike Hernandez from J underscore smooth. Kirstie says Thor. Thor from Justin Lamas. <laughs> you guys got it. That was the worst signing. But I don't think it's as bad as some people make it out to be. And here, let me explain why it's a one-year contract. What I always say, there's no such thing as a bad one-year contract. If you sign him to a two-year deal, he had two-year deals out there for him. He had three-year deals on the table that he could have signed. There were multi-year deals available to Noah Syndergaard, but he signed with the Dodgers because he wanted to get back to being an all-star, get back to being an ace-level pitcher. That never came to fruition. That never materialized. And if you look at how he performed in LA, he was absolutely awful. A 7-1-6 ERA with the Dodgers in 55 and a third innings of work. That literally was towards the bottom of the league. Worst starting pitcher in Dodgers history, essentially, through 55 innings of work. That's how bad it was for Noah Syndergaard. Thor was a thud. He wasn't throwing those light bulbs, those light bol lightning bolts anymore. And it's unfortunate because... He was never able to regain the velocity on his fastball. And that really is the issue. He's a velocity reliant pitcher and the Dodgers, they end up trading him for Ahmed Rosario. And the fact they were able to get anyone from him was a surprise, but he was last seen pitching with the Cleveland guardians. It hasn't been seen since, but uh, yeah, so we'll got a couple more bad ones here. We got, um, we got, we got the Lance Lynn trade. So two is Lance Lynn. So Lance Lynn was supposed to be a guy they traded for that was going to eat innings, be a Pac-Man pitcher. He did that to a degree, had some solid starts, but he was actually worse with the Dodgers than he was with the White Sox. If you look deeper into his numbers from an ERA perspective, he had a 647 ERA with the White Sox, a 436 ERA with the Dodgers. But, uh, but if you look at his overall numbers, as far as the FIP goes, they were bad. I mean, it, everything went up. The strikeout rate went up and it went down. And in 64 innings with the Dodgers, like I said, a 436 ERA FIP, it jumped from 519 to 616. The strikeout rate went from above league average, best of his career, down to 17.2%. That was the seventh worst in Major League Baseball after the trade deadline. The FIP went from 519 with the Y6. That was the third highest in Major League Baseball behind just Blatch and Giolito. Also give up 16 home runs, 16 dingers from 
Lance Lynn. So I got to put Lance Lynn as a Gory because you threw out Lance Lynn in an elimination game. I mean, that to me is pretty unbelievable. Then David Peralta. I mean, David Peralta had some good moments. He comes in at number three. David Peralta signed a six and a half million dollar deal. They were hoping that his offense was going to translate a little more towards the end of the season and pick it up. But he just was never able to get in the groove after he had that really hot stretch. And he's someone who did have a double in the postseason, but overall his numbers were not great. They were even down from last year. He ends up hitting 259. The OPS plus went from 91 down to 81. So it was 19% below league average. We got Lynn just gave up another home run. Yep. Exactly. Like we said yesterday, another home run. He's out somewhere, probably given a batting practice somewhere, but uh, yeah, I got to go with David Peralta. And then another move that I think you have to say was one of the worst moves was not making a move. I think we'll end on that one. Just not making a more aggressive move. And like I said, it's a little premature to completely have this conversation because you could look back and say, okay, maybe this is smart. Maybe this is sensible knowing how many injuries took place, knowing that Julio Arias was lost due to domestic violence charges, right? It could have been a situation where is it just reshuffling furniture on the Titanic? Maybe you could say that, but I still think that we still have not seen Andrew Friedman make an aggressive move in this era as far as the expanded postseason. So I would say the worst move was not making a move at all, but that's going to do it for this episode of Dodgers dugout live. Let's do some more comments where we head out. We got Kershaw should have pinched, should have pinch hit instead of Barnes. That's from D Mac jr. Yeah. I mean, he probably could put together a better at bat than Barnes did there. We got at this point, I think Hershiser would be a better manager. That's from Joe Mama. Yeah, we got some more thoughts on Dave Roberts. I wanted to really save that for tomorrow because I want to hear what Andrew Friedman has to say about Dave Roberts, but it'll be very interesting to see what his reaction is. We got to V. We need Juan Soto, Tommy Pham, or Randy Arozarena. By the way, who is the only person who said the Dodgers should have traded for Tommy Pham and has two thumbs? This guy. Right. You know, I love Tommy fam. I don't care about the off the field. stuff. I don't care about his locker room stuff. I don't care. I want to win baseball games. Okay. Sure. He slapped Jock Peterson. It's a fantasy football. You didn't slap your friends over fantasy football stuff. Come on now. It always happens. So, but like, I think Tommy fam is a uh, guy. They should have, should have picked up Randy Rose arena, you know, shoulders shrug. I'm cool with that Juan Soto. I'm not so sure on, I think you got a lefty bat. You bring in one, you bring in Freddie Freeman, you bring in oh, Shohei Otani. That's three lefty bats there. I don't think that that's the value. I don't think it's the value play for me. Juan Soto, when you consider the deal that he's going to get, I mean, as far as a trade goes, I mean, I don't anticipate a move happening with the Dodgers and the Padres, but could be pretty interesting. Julio's situation is hindsight. Danny. Yeah. Hindsight hyenas all over the place in this one. I'm just saying you could look at it as it, okay, it worked out at its best. If you're able to put the roster together that you want, you were able to get valuable experience for your young pitchers and we'll see how that translates moving forward. But that's going to do it for this episode of Dodgers dugout live. My name is Doug McCain. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at DMAC underscore LA. If you have not yet, be sure to subscribe to the channel, hit that subscribe button, hit that notification bell, hit that like button. Shout out to super producer Jordan over there. Find these comments. Always keep finding away with the comments all show long. We're going to have special sections. We're going to read off just comments. So make sure you're always finding your way with those comments. We'd love to get your takes down below. Remember nothing brings us together quite like Dodger baseball. And until next time, think blue.